Hi, this is Jay McClellan, and this is part four in my Build a Drone video series. In the last part, I built a stabilized camera platform and started shooting some aerial video. And in this part, I'm going to upgrade to an improved flight controller that has a faster processor and more I.O. And I'm going to set up communication between the flight controller and the on-screen display so that I can uh, send back real-time flight information from the flight controller to the, to the first-person video. One of the main reasons to provide real-time flight information in the on-screen display is to uh, inform the pilot of the orientation and heading of the craft, among other things. And uh, the, reason, the reason you want that is that if you don't have that kind of feedback, then if the craft gets far enough away, you can't really tell which way it's facing, and uh, it's very possible to lose it. And <laughs> the fact is, that happened. Uh, I flew the drone over my house, and uh, I got it up above the tops of the trees uh, trying to shoot video of my house and the wind speed increased very rapidly and the drone started moving away from me uh, quite rapidly to the point where I could still see it but I couldn't tell which way it was headed anymore. I, I immediately looked at the first person video feed trying to use visual cues but really mostly it was showing me trees and I lost it. <laughs> it flew away. Uh, I Once I realized it, it drifted out to the point where the video feed was lost so I I cut power to try to crash it into the woods, and I think it crashed into the woods uh, just downwind of the house. But we went out looking for it with the video receiver, hoping that it was still transmitting, and we didn't find it. Obviously, that's very disappointing. Uh, but I did have a full set of spare parts that I had, had uh, bought so that I could repair uh, in case of crashes. So I basically have all the parts I need to build another drone, but it's a big box of parts. And, uh, you know, putting it together is a lot of work. There's, I got to mount everything. I got to do all the assembly, do all the wiring. And uh, really, I wish I could just, you know, snap my fingers and have that done. Well, that was easy enough. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so I rebuilt it. Uh, I rebuilt a new drone that's basically the same as, uh, as the previous one. Uh, however, it's got a new flight controller, which I'll show you. Uh, and this is, a, this is a more powerful controller that has more capability. And I'm going to, in this video, set up the feed between the flight controller and the on-screen display so I can get better flight information. Uh, in the next video, I'm also going to add a compass and a GPS, which will work a lot better. But in this video, I'm just going to set up uh, that communication, and I'm also going to build a new uh, video platform. Uh, instead of the camera gimbal, uh, I'm going to build just a really lightweight sort of first-person view uh, live video transmitter that doesn't do recording. It just sends back a live video feed from the camera. I considered rebuilding the camera gimbal and, uh, and camera assembly that I showed in the previous video, um, but I didn't have the parts, and so I would have to go out and buy them. And so that, that's a viable option, I think, for the price. It really delivered pretty good video, and so, you know, if, if that's the level of budget you're looking at, I think it's, it's a very good option. Uh, but I decided to go up a notch for, uh, for shooting video in particular from the air. I really was looking for a higher level of quality, and so I decided to spend the money and upgrade to a DJI Mavic Pro. <laughs> so this doesn't fit within everyone's price range, um, but the video quality is amazing, and I look forward to, uh, to sharing some of that soon. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of video shot with the uh, Turnigy, $70 Turnigy camera that I used in the previous uh, platform and shot with the Mavic Pro. So it's, it's a higher-end option, and you, know, you have to pay for it, but, uh, but the drone has a lot of capability. So, um, so that's, that's going to be my go-to option for shooting aerial video. So why keep working on this drone? Well, it's uh, it's going to be a better choice for things like first-person video racing and aerobatics where it's going to be lighter and more maneuverable. And the Mavic is great for shooting aerial video, but uh, a drone that I built myself is actually a better choice for some things I have in mind, like amateur radio experiments, where I want to be able to customize not just the hardware of the drone and the payload section, but also the software and the flight controller. And so having a, having a build-it-yourself drone gives me a cheaper option for some kinds of flying, where it may be putting it more risk and uh, and allows me to customize essentially everything about it. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, proceed to build the uh, the new lightweight first person video platform and hook up the new flight controller and enhance the on-screen display. 
Here's the new flight controller, and it's the same size as the CC3D that I used in the previous build, but it has a faster microprocessor and a lot more I.O. So you can see on this side there are four uh, I.O. connectors, and then there's two uh, front and back, so a lot more connections for a lot more communication. And there's quite a big tangle of wires here because the line's going to the receiver. Because I have an older style or a simpler style receiver where I need to run a signal for each channel, there's a lot of wires that have to go back and forth, and some of them have to go to this connector, and some have to go to this connector, so it's a little bit tangled, but not too bad. And right here, this connection is for it provides a 5-volt serial uh, interface that's going to go to the on-screen display. So this is one of the many, uh, many additional connections this has. This board is an SP Racing F3, uh, or more properly, this is a cheap clone of an SP Racing S3. And I, I didn't really realize that when I bought it. I thought I was getting a real board, but it's not. And if you, if you buy one like this, I really recommend trying to get the genuine board. Number one, it's going to be better supported. And number two, by buying the real thing from uh, Seriously Pro Racing, uh, you're helping to support the open source software development of the Clean Flight software that it runs. So when I realized I had a clone, I went out to the Clean Flight website and made a donation to uh, kind of atone for buying a cheap knockoff and, and support, the, uh, support the open source development a little bit. Here's the layout for my minimalist first person video platform. I have this Fat Shark transmitter which came with my uh, Fat Shark goggles, and uh, it's similar to the transmitter I used in the first build, except that it's only 250 milliwatts. Otherwise, pretty much the same. And I have this camera up here, which I'll set inside so you can see a little better, that came with the Fat Shark package as well. It's a little analog video camera. It has a resolution of about 640 by 480, so it's uh, it's not high res by any means, uh, but it's good enough for first-person video that connects to the transmitter directly, uh, or in my case, it's going to go and send video through this little on-screen display board, which is the minimum OSD, same kind that I used in the previous build. Um, and, and that's really it as far as the electrical components. And then mechanically, I use my 3D printer to make this base plate, and it has these rubber vibration isolators that will attach to the base plate of the drone. So all I need to do is attach these components and wire it up, and the video platform will be done. Here's the finished assembly. I've got the expansion connector here that connects up to the flight section, brings in battery voltage as well as a signal ground and receive and transmit lines for the communication going to the on-screen display. The battery voltage comes in to a 470 microfarad capacitor to provide some filtering, help suppress noise from the flight section, and then it goes to the battery connector on the transmitter, and the battery line also runs down to the voltage sensing lines on the on-screen display so that it can display the battery voltage. Then the um, transmitter provides a 5-volt output, and the 5-volt output runs both the camera and the on-screen display. And the video from the camera comes into the on-screen display here, comes back out, and then goes to the transmitter. Here's the video platform assembled to the drone, and you can see it tucks fairly neatly. Uh, right under here with the vibration isolators and all the components up inside. And it even serves as sort of a uh, uh, improvised landing skid. Here's the left side of the flight controller. And when I showed this earlier, I had this connector in the wrong spot. It goes in, the, in this view, the lower left connector. That is the UART1 connection that provides communication to the on-screen display. And the hardware that runs it is shared with the USB connection. So to program the flight controller, unfortunately, I have to disconnect this line. And then I can put a USB cable, micro USB, in to connect it to my computer. The software I'm using for this board is called CleanFlight. And CleanFlight runs as an app inside the Google Chrome browser. So you'll need to get Google Chrome and then install this app and launch it in order to configure the flight controller. The first thing to do is to flash current firmware onto the board. And so I've selected the SP Racing F3 and I'll select the latest stable firmware. Um, the default selections are generally okay. Uh, however, for this particular board, and again, uh, this is a clone of the real thing, uh, I had to set a manual baud rate of 256 K baud. And then once you select the firmware and the settings you want, you can click load firmware online and it will go download the latest firmware and then press flash firmware. Oh, I won't do it because I've already done it, uh, but press, press flash firmware to uh, put the current firmware onto the board. 
pressing connect will connect to the board. And as soon as it connects, you can verify that, uh, that it's kind of alive and as you expect just by uh, moving the drone, I'm going to move the model and you can see that the accelerometers are feeding information to the clean flight configurator. If the drone is physically sitting level but doesn't look level on the screen, then you can calibrate the accelerometer in the software. Next I'll switch to the ports tab and configure the communication ports. And my UART1 is used for configuration because it's part of the uh, USB connection. But when I'm not connected to USB, I also want to use that for Mavlink. Mavlink is the communication protocol that my on-screen display accepts to send information uh, from the flight controller. Next I'll switch to the configuration tab. I used the same motor numbering scheme that I used in the previous build, and so I need to select quad X1234. As with the previous model, I mounted the board 90 degrees uh, yawed, 90 degrees from its nominal location, and so I need to enter an offset here to compensate for that. Once I enter the offset, I'll save and reboot and then and double check it in the uh, front page. I reset the yaw offset and now I need to recalibrate the accelerometers because things are a kilter a little bit again. So picking up the back, banking to the right, banking to the left, picking up the front. Another thing I need to change on the configuration tab if I scroll to the bottom, is that my receiver is pulse width modulation, one wire per channel. Once I'm done on uh, making a change, I'll save and reboot the board. At this point, I'm ready to check the communication coming from the receiver. So I'll switch to the receiver tab. So now I'll connect the battery. So the model is under battery power, and uh, now I'll power up the, the uh, RC transmitter. And you can double check um, with the little model down in the lower right, it's, it's a little bit unstable, but you can kind of try to fly that little model uh, around. So I'm trying to get it level here with the sticks. And in particular, make sure that the sticks move in the, in the direction that you think they should. Next, I'll switch to the motors tab. And I absolutely have propellers removed at this point. So I'm going to switch the switch on to enable me to modify motor settings. And now with these sliders, I can apply power to each of the motors in turn. So the first thing to do is just make sure that each motor runs and also check the rotation direction of each motor. And if it's going in the wrong direction, then I uh, need to stop and uh, swap two of the three input leads to the motor and that'll reverse its direction. To configure the on-screen display, I need to connect up a serial interface, and I'm using this FTDI Friend board from Adafruit, and I need to connect this to the connector you can see in the background, and then this will also provide 5-volt power to run the on-screen display while I'm configuring it. To configure the on-screen display, I'm using another Chrome app, uh, MWOSD Configurator, and the first thing I'm going to do is uh, flash current firmware. I'm going to select clean flight uh, firmware so you get different firmware builds of the OSD depending on what it's going to communicate with. I'm going to load the firmware online and then we'll press flash to flash the firmware on. Firmware flashing is complete. Now I'll connect to the board. Once I've connected the first thing I'll do is upload the correct font for this application. I'm going to uh, basically take this default and I'm just going to turn off a few things that I know I'm not going to need. The video voltage indicator, I don't have wired up and I don't plan to, and so I select that and then turn uh, that to disable it. We'll go ahead and write that to the on-screen display. All right, well here goes. I'm going to try to take off more gently than I did on the first test flight of the previous drone. There we go. Yeah, hmm, interesting. Well, my first two flights didn't go so well, and I figured out what the problem is. Uh, the default flight mode of clean flight is uh, is not the same as the default flight mode of the uh, Libre Pilot that I was using. 
Uh, so the CC3D by default will come up and auto level itself and clean flight does not. If you look in the documentation online for clean flight modes, there are a bunch of them and uh, the closest one, the closest equivalent to what I'm accustomed to is angle. Uh, it's, it's an auto leveling mode that, you know, it's good for beginners, uh, which I am certainly with this flight controller. And so I want to switch the copter into angle mode. That's going to be a lot easier for me to control getting started. In the clean flight configurator app, on the modes tab. Uh, for each one you can add a range of control inputs that will put it into that mode. I'm going to use angle mode and I just want it to be in angle mode all the time. Uh, I'm going to switch this to the auxiliary 4 input channel which I'm not even using. It's not even connected and I'm going to open up the sliders all the way so that basically it's going to be in angle mode whenever AUX4 is anywhere in this range which should be all the time. I'll press save well, the first two flights were a little rough. Uh, I now have it uh, switched into uh, the stabilized mode. And in fact, you can see it on the on-screen display. It used to show acro for acrobatic mode. Now it shows a stabilized icon. So I know I have it locked into level or uh, angle mode this time. So uh, hopefully it'll work a little better, but uh, we'll, we'll just uh, try it and see. Here we go. There we go. Had to get uh, get my head calibrated here for the sensitivity of the controls. A little bit different than what I'm used to, but uh, definitely a flying in stabilized mode now. The trim is off a little bit, and I think maybe the uh, uh, gyros weren't quite calibrated, or they calibrated on my little launching uh, board there, which isn't sitting perfectly level. So uh, hands off the stick, it drifts forward a little bit, but that's okay. Anyway, uh, much better. <laughs> it flies, it doesn't crash. So uh, for my final trick, let's try landing it and uh, without damaging it. Here we go. That was a little bit of a hard landing, but I saw it over the pad and I dropped it to get it down. So I <laughs> didn't want to break the, break the props again. Okay, well, great. We have a quadcopter again. Uh, we have first person video and uh, we'll go back and uh, analyze the footage. Here's some footage I recorded uh, flying around my garden, and uh, you can see that the video quality is really quite bad, but that's okay for, for this purpose because I can talk about some of the problems in the video and things we might do to improve them. So the first thing to know is that I'm recording this using a, a very small, very cheap uh, analog DVR that is uh, attached to the receiver on my little portable um, receiver display panel. So this is coming back over the radio link and then it's being recorded by this inexpensive little DVR. And I'll pause the video so you can take a close look. Uh, you can see that there are quite a lot of compression artifacts here. And so these are actually introduced by my little cheap uh, DVR and aren't really part of the video stream coming back from the drone. The other obvious thing that's going on is that you can see there's a lot of flashing and overall video flickering in and out. And uh, I'm not 100% sure what the source of that is. It's possible that I have a loose connection. And so I'm going to have to go over the video platform and see if that's the case. I actually suspect that a lot of this is the receiver in, the, uh, in my little monitor is losing synchronization. And it's possible that switching to a different channel or a different transmission mode may improve that. Uh, I also think that the antenna I'm using, especially on the quadcopter, is in a rather poor configuration. It's sticking straight out the back horizontally, and that is by no means optimal. Uh, vertical would be better for that antenna, and I think that going to a cloverleaf antenna is likely to improve the quality quite a bit because then I get a circular polarization which is much less sensitive to changes in the orientation of the craft. Here's another flight from a different location with a, a slightly different arrangement between the receiver and the drone. And um, when it first takes off, there's a little bit of uh, video cutting in now. But right now, um, you'll see in a moment, it actually gets pretty stable right about in here. Um, still get a little bit of flickering, but it's a lot better. 
And uh, so that kind of confirms my theory that it's the antenna orientation causing a lot of the problems. Uh, previously, the way I was filming it, the antenna was pointing straight out the back of the craft and kind of straight at the receiver, which is about the worst possible orientation for that antenna. It sends very little signal uh, along its axis. And so a moment ago when I flew up above the receiver, it got fairly clear. And now as I come back down and fly away from the receiver, you can see the video gets really, really poor. So I think this is primarily then due to uh, poor signal reception because of the orientation of the antenna. And, and partly because of the type of antenna, where uh, I think going to the cloverleaf hopefully will we'll solve the problem. I just don't have a cloverleaf that fits this transmitter yet. So that's on order, and uh, we'll have to try that. And um, so I'll show you that in the future. But um, other than that, other than this, you know, the terrible flickering in and out that I think is mainly an antenna issue, um, the video is pretty good. But uh, one other artifact you can see uh, from time to time is kind of a jello effect. And... Um, as it as the video kind of shimmers and that's a real common problem where the vibration isolation you can see it real clearly here the vibration isolation between the flight section and the video section is not good enough and so i'm getting a lot of shaking which honestly isn't a huge problem if you're just using first person video to pilot the craft uh, it still works um, i'm not planning to use this for recording but uh, again, here we, you can see we got up a little bit higher and the video quality improved. And then I get closer to the receiver where I'm kind of pointed at it again and the video quality gets worse. So once again, um, that kind of confirms the antenna theory. And the, the jello effect, I think I can improve a little bit by uh, adding some mass to the flight section, which I can do with other kinds of payloads. I hate to add mass because, of course, that reduces my flight time. Um, or I can just live with it because really the jello for purposes of piloting the craft doesn't bother me that much. It's mainly this flickering in and out, and I think I can solve that with, uh, with better antennas. Well, that wraps up part four. Uh, obviously, losing the previous drone was bad for me, but kind of good for you. You got to see a couple of different options as far as the flight controller and the video section. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you found that useful. You got to see me struggle a little bit getting the new flight controller up and running. But in the end, I think it's working reasonably well. I do have some problems with the video quality uh, transmitted, and so that's something to work on. And hopefully in the next part, I'll be able to show you some improvements there. And uh, primarily in the next part five, I'm going to be adding a GPS and compass module uh, to provide some navigation information. So hopefully this drone will be a little easier to pilot and uh, won't, be, won't get lost. <laughs> so thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Mm -hmm.